Well, hello everybody. Today I'm going to go over my new build, which is a lake fort that's a smaller town and also a trade city. Now what's great about this is there's actually only two ways in to this town, so I'm able to really concentrate my defenses. I'm playing this map on the hardest difficulty, so I'm getting attacked quite frequently by some pretty large armies, and so far it's been able to withstand pretty much everything. So I'm only using one residential area for this build with one market square. I have a residential area, I have a storage area right here, I have some commerce buildings right here. I have industrial buildings right here nestled between the storage facilities for optimal time and optimal production, and I keep the heavier industrial buildings in the north. Alright, so now we're going to talk about defenses. More specifically, we're going to talk about range, and we're going to talk about boxing in your towers, compartmentalizing your defense. When I first was running this, I was just running one wall or two walls, and then I found out that the AI gets kind of confused when it gets into compartments. Like, if they break this one door down and your towers are right there, they're going to start beating on the towers. But if they break this door and they got to go through another door and the towers are still there, then they have to break these two towers down while being shot by the fort here. Then they got to break this, then they got to break this gate down, and then they got to break this wall down to hit the fort they'll never make it they're getting hit by too much so i started realizing that, that literally two towers boxed in is stronger than like four towers with a wall in front of it because once they break through that wall they're going to be in hitting your towers so you just want to box everything so I realized that creating these little channels really disrupts them. I like to double wall the outer layer because it increases the time it takes to get even into this area. All the while they're just being pelted. I keep gates because if they break in over here I don't want them to be able to just run over here. That gives your towers time to start shooting everything. Now for this design I put four towers all clustered together. This tends to be the direction they attack from. I did put one more tower over here just to keep focus because if I have enemies here and I have enemies over here, these four towers might be shooting this while this area is being attacked. So it is kind of nice to have just like one little tower that is focused on one general area just to keep it safe. These four towers clear this whole area. Little towers just kind of control the, the little bit of dead zone that's there. And these two towers control this area the barracks trolling this general area when i get attacked it's usually from this direction so like i found the kind of path that it took this is one route they take the second route they take are these two areas right here so early in the game i only had one wall and it would cause a problem when they break through it and run to this gate so i created these towers back here behind this wall to control any leakage that gets in i created these walls to protect all of this infrastructure from being destroyed in case of an attack now what makes this design so powerful say they broke through these four walls while being shot up they would still have to then come all the way over here and break through this gate to get into this. When the enemies attack, they go towards what is attacking them. By having this centralized fortified area, I've created basically an object that attracts any enemies that get in here and destroys them. If they did break in through these walls, they then are stuck in this like kill zone, getting shot from all of these towers while they stand still and beat on this gate. Now I have eight people in this fort. I have two people in these forts. I created this third extra wall. If they happen to get through this wall, once they get into this area, to the main area, the barracks start shooting, raining down. This barracks and this main fort cover the two central areas that they can come in from. I used this same concept when I created this four tower fortified area down here and this barracks and two tower fortified area. The main armies with siege equipment has always come from the north, which is why I focus a lot more heavily up here. The fort provides a better hit bonus, it has a lot more HP, and it allows you to send men out. That's why I have two of them, but I don't keep them as stocked as as you would want to. It's actually cheaper to build two towers and reduce my barracks by four, but the primary purpose of barracks is to fill gaps in your defenses when you're being attacked by a large force. That's why I have two of them on opposing sides, one in the northeast and one in the southwest. The barracks is also really good for killing bears and boars that are attacking your, your population. Another key feature of my defense is that I put my town center right in the middle of my defenses. And the reason I did this is I realized the town center is a giant free tower that rains arrows down magically. When the bandits came or originally, I only had my town center and a wall to fend them off and it worked. In earlier videos, I wasn't aware of this. Someone actually brought this up to me and thank you. You can delete the town center. 
you just have to hit clear buildings and highlight it and then it will delete it then they'll deconstruct it and then you go to buildings amenities and it will highlight and you'll be able to place it again the downside of this is you have to build it back up from tier one so don't be afraid if you put the town center in the wrong spot because you can move it and here you can see the southern defense so this is my my barrack my little fort back here in the two towers but pretty much it can take anything coming at it i have 62 raiders currently hitting me so let's go see what other areas they're at all right and then the areas that they're coming from is the north so now you're going to get to see my four towers and work here they're probably going to kill a few people but these four towers and then that other tower down there are just going to tear they just tear because these guys all my guys have crossbows Right now they're just hitting like a little outer wall I built. They haven't even gotten into anything. If they do get in, say they break this gate, they still gotta break this gate and this gate, and then they're stuck in this little channel still getting fired at. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Most of the time they don't even get close to getting in. And here's another wave against the south. Like there's three waves in total in this. That's why I put the barracks where it is right there, and I put those two towers there. The two towers just kind of like chase off the enemies, and that barracks just lays down the suppression. Alright, I'm going to give you a general overview of every sector. Each residential area comprises of a market, a school, and a hospital. In order to maximize the bonus from decoration buildings, because they only benefit once from each type, I place them strategically so that every single house has access to like the major ones. But there is one building, the small plaza, which you can actually spam under your road system, and it gives 1% to each house. So every single plaza within the radius, it gets a bonus for it. It's the only building you can spam. As you can see, everything is well within the realm of where it needs to be. I place a large park here, and this large park hits every single building. Down here I place the medium park, which gets the lower corner. Up here I have a medium park, which hits that sector. And then over here I have a medium park, which hits this sector. I didn't have room over here for a medium park, but that's okay. I have a shrine down here for that sector. A shrine up here for that sector. A shrine over here for this sector. No shrine down there, that's all right too. A large statue right here for this sector. I have one medium statue for this residential here, and I have one medium statue which hits all the other residentials. So every house is just those two medium statues in those locations hits every single house. All right, so I have several ways I like to do storage which are centered around the rat catchers. I have a total of three rat catchers in this build and I'll show you that right now. I have rat catchers basically filling in this whole residential area. I like to keep the granaries really close to the windmills. That's why I put the windmills here. I will be going over this in detail, but it will tell you what your pet, your, your workers are doing. They have idle time where they run around to get resources. So the closer they are to those resources, the more time they're, they spend working. So these guys are working 36% of the time and they're idle 40% of the time. That basically just means that there's less resources coming in than are, than are necessary for them to be working all the time. I don't particularly have a concern with this industry, with other industries I would, simply because to me, food is, is a critical resource and I prefer to overproduce. The only reason I would say that this could be potentially misleading though, is that foods do spoil. Yeah, they're standing around 40% of the time, but when the food comes in, you want everyone working so that that stuff doesn't spoil. Technically, yes, you could min max it when those things are coming in. But if you were to do that, there are so many industries within your city, like maybe, you know, you would just be constantly going through every, like pausing the game every five minutes, like, okay, is so-and-so doing this and that. So honestly, just for like ease of gameplay, I tend to overstaff like industries. I don't want to micromanage. To rat catchers, I keep a bunch of grain inventory here to collect the harvest. I also have my rat catcher here so that I can gather from all of them. The second rat catcher I focus in this residential area and to hit these storages. I put these storages specifically here so that they could all be in this area. But I like to keep the root cellars also close to the farms. Like I said, the shorter the distance, they go out to the farms, they bring products back, they go home. The market is right here so it can come and it can grab resources. The closer resources are to the areas that they are being produced and coming from the higher their productivity and then my third rat catcher is located here in my last storage area so this is my main storage area stockyards don't need rat catchers they don't get rats it's just storage root cellars and granaries so you want to place them towards your residential areas 
And then as you can see here, I don't have any rat catchers for this area. It's all industrial and doesn't require it. This allows you to like minimize the amount of rat catchers you need. And then you have your compost yards. And those are necessary to remove the waste that accumulates in housing. Now, early game, I actually got away with one compost yard until, like, honestly, the last two hours of this build. So manors bring in more waste because they have more people living in them, bringing in items that spoil. And it's, it's crazy because I actually have to have three compost yards to keep this all under control. I have one compost yard here, one compost yard here, and then I put one compost yard outside over here. Now I also have three pubs that you can see here, three bakeries that you can see here. Bakeries give a desirability bonus and I have those strategically placed to both increase the desirability of location and also to provide bread to the houses which helps them with upgrading because you need three types of food. I put my trading center right here next to the warehouses and storage just so that it was easier to move goods. Later in the game, and I wouldn't recommend this till much later, I have an apothecary here. Over here I have a Fletcher's workshop, a brewery, three candle makers, and those are really critical to this build. One is a trade supply, and two as a luxury item, which is sold in the market, which generates luxury taxes. But only manors can generate luxury taxes. That's why the rush to get manors is very critical, because luxury taxes are, like right now, one of the biggest incomes I have. Now that's 408 gold I'm making a month. The resources to produce this are extremely minimal. It takes one firewood, and it takes two wax. I scatter the apiaries everywhere. It's pretty much a free resource. The laborers just have to go by and pick them up. Firewood is incredibly cheap. One log makes 15 firewood, which means that one log provides enough firewood for 15 times four, which is 60 candles. So one lumber is basically your real cost for 60 candles plus the workforce and time and everything that you're feeding them. So the wax is free. It doesn't cost anything. It's an infinite resource. Two furniture shops in my build right here. For early game, I suggest you get a basket shop. Baskets increase the carry rate of your peasants. I have six firewood splitters. I'm only currently using four of them. There are times when you need to ramp up production for firewood. I don't typically have all of the industries that you see active, but there are times when you need to ramp up and that's why I have them. There's lots of buildings that take hundreds and hundreds of planks, so I actually have four upgraded sawmills. Right now I have three active because I'm creating furniture, and I'm creating furniture to both sell at the trading center and also to generate luxury taxes. So all of these items that you see here, when they sell you get a luxury tax. In my industrial area, I have all the basics. I really recommend that you have at least two brick yards because bricks are huge. I also buy all the bricks that I can find. I do have a smelter. And I will buy raw ore when I see it for sale. And I will also just buy the straight up ingots. I also have an upgraded arsenal which is currently producing shields. Once I get enough shields, I'm actually going to start just producing plate mail for myself. I also have a glass maker. I do buy sand and create glassware because it is a luxury item. And it makes money for me. I have a blacksmith workshop. Currently, I'm just producing swords and some heavy tools. I will eventually, though, start producing mainly heavy weapons and some basic tools. I have a soap shop right there. I have one work camp, which I use to collect the trees I plant. I've said this in other videos. I'll just go over it again. You can plant trees by going to decorations and just selecting the trees. I have one weaver building here as a test to show you. So this is actually really efficient, considering it's so far away from the source. Then I have one weaver building here outside of where the flax is actually gathered. I keep my tannery next to my barn. I had a massive idle time when it was up north. If you keep your tannery right next to your barn, the work time is insanely high. As you can see, it's 96%. I also keep the smokehouses near where I make meat for that reason. I have two smokehouses here next to a barn. And then I have two up here in my industrial sector. Now you can scatter your fishing shacks however you feel. In the early game, I actually had more fishing shacks than this, but I went down on that kind of stuff. If you click up here in the top corner, you can see your food production. What's produced? how much of it's consumed, and how much is spoiling. So as you can see, my vegetables are really spoiling. Now this actually used to be a lot worse, but it's really great to see like what you're overproducing. For instance, I was producing 6,000 grains and 5,000 of them were spoiling. And I noticed that root vegetables weren't weren't spoiling as much and were being consumed so you can kind of see like the diet preference that your people have one thing i notice is like fruit and dairy hardly ever spoils those are things people will always eat over all of these other things see nobody's eating greens they're just they don't there's like better food so like my people have gotten really spoiled 
literally. So I started growing more root vegetables and they're consuming more of them. Root vegetables also last 12 months, have a higher shelf life. So you can like come in here and say, okay, like how much am I actually getting out of growing these things? And then you can change that up. The same with protein. I noticed for all the meat I was making, it was spoiling. So that encouraged me to create those two smoke houses that you saw down by the barn. So you can quickly come in here and see like if what you're producing is actually having an impact and you can pull back on certain productions. I actually had two barns and half of my meat was boiling. So I just got rid of the barn because it served no purpose.